Welcome back to another episode of ILTV. I'm your host, Lynn Ferrari. The US banking sector is blowing up the headlines lately, and International Living's chief global diversification expert, Ted Bauman, is here to give us the lowdown as to what exactly is happening, what caused the collapse of the Signature Bank and the Silicon Valley Bank, and what does that mean for the average American? The Wall Street Journal recently posted how unrest in the banking sector could make it hard for people to obtain loans to buy homes, cars and other large ticketed items. Ted gives us his take on that and talks about why that's not necessarily a bad thing. So what's the solution? What should people be doing with their money? Or should I say, where should people be putting their money? Check out the episode to find out Ted's recommendations and strategies. I hope you enjoy the episode. As always, I'll ask you to subscribe and hit the notification button so you'll get notified once we release a new episode. If there's anything you'd like Ted to cover in upcoming episodes, please leave a comment below. If you are interested in this type of content and you're looking to ways to diversify your life or yourself, sign up for our free daily postcards. There's also a link below and you can check out more of Ted's writings and musings on the International Living website. So I thank you for watching and enjoy the episode. Ted, welcome back to ILTV. It's great to have you again. How are you? I'm well, thanks, Lynn. And you? I am very good. I'm very good. I'm excited to talk about this topic. So just for everyone, Ted is IL's chief global diversification expert, and he's joining me here today to talk about where to put your money and if it's safer to put it outside the U.S., so we'll get into it. Um, Ted, the US banking system is blowing up the headlines at the moment. Can you give me a bit of insight into what exactly is going on? Well, um, it's been a while since the first bank failure and there's been a lot of press out there. So I'm sure some of our viewers would have heard this story. But in a nutshell, um, during the long period when interest rates were very low, um, banks like Silicon Valley Bank, the one, the first one that failed, were taking lots of deposits um, you know, and, and they have to obviously invest those deposits in something uh, in order to make a little bit of interest so they can pay interest on the deposits, right? That's how banks work. Right. So for a long time, they were investing in treasury bonds, but long dated treasury bonds, five years, 10 years, 30 years, uh, because those tend to carry higher interest rates, right? I mean, longer term bonds, more risk, higher interest rates. Now, the problem is that um, when the Fed started raising interest rates uh, recently to combat inflation, the value of those bonds fell as the interest rates rose because, you know, yields on bonds are inverse uh, to the price of the bond. So as the Fed was raising interest rates, the value, let's say, of, of a thousand dollar five year treasury bond maybe went from nine hundred ninety five dollars down to, say, nine hundred and sixty five dollars. You know, right. because of the rise in interest rates, all of a sudden these banks were holding bonds that were worth a lot less than the deposits that they owed to their depositors, and you know, theoretically, under most conditions, that wouldn't be an issue because you know the banks could dip into their equity, they could you know raise more cash, but in this case, everybody panicked, uh, and because it's Silicon Valley, everybody was on Twitter, everybody was on WhatsApp or whatever, and they all said to each other, "Hey, we think Silicon Valley is running out of money." take your, your your deposits out. And of course, that's a bank run. And nobody can survive that, regardless of how strong the bank is. Now, the bigger problem, and, and look, let's just say that's a problem of bank management. And apparently, banking regulators had been telling Silicon Valley Bank, you need to clean this up. And, right. they, and they didn't do it because they were they were afraid that they were going to lose profits if, if they, you know, if they Put it right there. took action. Mm -hmm. So that was a bad bank, bad bank. Um, but the rest of the banking system really, you know, it, it's it's contagion. You know, even if there's nothing wrong with a bank, if everybody comes to and says, I want all my money back all at once, there's no bank in the world that can survive that because that's the way banks yeah. work. We give them money. They use it to invest, to make money. Then, you know, they pay interest. So really, it's it's a question of confidence. It's not a question of any specific, you know, structural, mechanical problem in the financial system. People just panic. And uh, mm -hmm. when there's a panic, um, you need to do something. And the Fed and the Treasury Department did that basically by saying, well, we'll come up with a solution that guarantees that people will get their money back. And that's where we are right now. So the collapse of the Silicon and the Signature Bank, right? Both of them was down yeah. to a confidence in their customers. 
Kind of. I mean, I think in Signature Bank's case, it was also that the um, the New York banking regulators basically said, look, we're not confident that you actually have uh, the capacity to meet right. potential withdrawals. And so they preemptively shut them down before there was a bank run. Uh, so, you know, the banking regulators in that case looked at, at, at um, Signature Bank and said, you guys have a similar client profile to Silicon Valley in that they're mainly tech companies. They're all smart. Mm -hmm. They're all talking to each other. If they come to you and want their money back, there's going to be a problem. So we're going to preempt that and, and intervene, which is the right thing to do. Right. And what does it mean for the average American then? Are they losing confidence in other banks? Is there going to be more bank runs? Uh, well, look, there'll only be more bank runs if people lose confidence. And right now there doesn't appear to be a, a, a massive loss of confidence. Having said that, um, what we're seeing is that a lot of big corporate customers are transferring their money from bank accounts to money market funds. Right. I'll talk about those in a minute. But basically, money market funds are an alternative way to hold cash um, that's a much more direct relationship to, to treasury bonds than having it in a bank. And so we have seen a lot of outflows. I think the, the, the latest figure I saw was about $140 billion worth of, of outflows since the, uh, the initial problem. Now, that's right. Peanuts compared to the overall size of the, the U.S. banking sector, mm -hmm. but I think the, you know the key thing for the average American. I mean, I'm sure there are people listening who have more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in a single account. Um, if they do right now, those accounts are protected because the, the Fed has said they will. But uh, anybody with less than two hundred and fifty thousand in an account is already protected, so you don't need to panic. You don't need to run. And and right now, I think. You know, it really is more just about emotion than rationality. And um, I think the Fed and the Treasury have done the right things, but there are some underlying problems in the uh, in the financial sector in the U.S., which we'll talk about in a bit. Right. And so the Wall Street Journal had was talking about how the unrest in the banking sector could, could make it hard for customers to obtain, you know, loans to buy homes or cars or more big ticketed items. What do you think about mm. that? Well, I mean, look, when when you have problems like this, it, part of the problem is the spread between what banks can earn on um, the money that they invest. In other words, right. customers give them deposits, they invest them, that money, earn it, um, return, and then pay uh, uh, interest back to to their clients. Right. So depositors are looking at banks and thinking, "Hey, there's risk involved here. So I'm not going to put my money into a bank unless I get a higher interest rate." That means that the the banks have got to make um, more money on their investments in order to pay those higher interest rates to depositors. And that means that they're probably going to raise the interest rates charged on things like cars, home loans, etc., uh, in order to uh, reflect the fact that the banking sector is under higher risk than it is normally. Um, also, I think they're going to look very carefully at the safety of the mm -hmm. potential loan that they make, because, um, you know, when things are really loose and everything is fine, you know, you can make loans and accept a higher level of risk because you think, OK, well, if we had a, you know, a 2 percent default rate, that's no problem. We can deal with that because we're making a lot of money. Right. But when it's not the case, you can't afford those high default rates. So they look more carefully at the borrowers and say, mm, I don't know, um, you know, Tighten the and, and so the lending standards get tight. And, and that's the other problem that we're having right now. Right. Right. And so, OK, that's good context for everyone. But. Uh -huh. I'm sure people watching this want to know what they're meant to do. So what is the solution? Where should What should people be doing with their money? Or should I say, where should they be putting their money? <laughs> well, the first thing I would say is don't panic, right? Don't mm -hmm. overestimate the problem. Because the problem is, it, it was very specific. Um, it was a specific bank that did not anticipate um, this development. You know, they, they were basically betting that interest rates wouldn't rise as, as high and as fast as they did. And I don't know why anybody would do that. So this was a mm -hmm. this was bad decision-making by a bank. Right. And it was bad decision-making, I think, by the regulators in the, the San Francisco Fed and also the California authorities. But that's just one bank, right? The rest of the banking sector, just you know, don't overestimate the problem. Now, there is a higher level of risk. And of course, everybody uh, you know, knows that. I know that. So uh, we're paying more attention. Uh, but don't let the headlines determine what you do. That, that would be my mm -hmm. first advice. Second thing is um, take advantage of federal deposit insurance. As long as you keep your uh, total account balances less than $250,000, you're, 
you're fully insured by the FDIC. And, and that's been in place since the New Deal. Um, it was put in place specifically to address bank runs like the ones that we've just seen, but back in the 30s. And mm-hmm. it's worked fine ever since. Um, I've heard stories of people who take you know multi-million dollar fortunes and break them up into chunks of 250 and spread them around lots of different banks to protect themselves. Right. I mean, that's one way to do it. Uh, but the idea. average person, I think, is protected. All right. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing you can do is put your money into money market funds, just like corporations are doing. And that means maybe let's say you have a brokerage um, at a place like Fidelity or Charles Schwab or one of the other. Um, as Let's say you have a retirement account at one of these places. Well, they also have uh, other account services, and one of them is money market funds. And money market funds are essentially a one-to-one relationship between the cash you put in and their holdings of treasury bonds. In other words, their current value of the treasury bonds they hold, not you know their, their face value, but what they're actually worth right now. Uh, right. And so they have a very strict rule, um, and that is don't break the buck. That means for every dollar that's deposited into a money market fund, there must be one dollar of assets backing it up. Uh, and so these are much safer. Of course, they don't earn much interest, but they're safe. So if you're really concerned and you have a lot of money, um, you might move it into money market funds. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, when people have retirement accounts, they have what's known as a sweep account, which is, uh, let's say that you you have 80% of your money invested in stocks or ETFs or something, or bonds. The other 20% is automatically going into a money market fund already. So most people are okay. already exposed to this. So that's a good one. And then, of course, there's gold. You know, um, right. gold is a good one. Um uh, you know, I think gold, and sometimes it becomes a little bit, um, you, you know, people mythologize it and, and they, you know, they think that the world's about to end. It's always about to end. I mean, if you look at a lot yeah. of, you know, like in, in, in our world, in the financial press and, and, you know, we see people saying the dollar is about to collapse and all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, um, that's not going to happen right away. But holding gold is always a good idea because it, it keeps its value. For example, if the dollar were to decline in value, uh, if, if there was a confidence problem, gold would go up by the same amount because it's, you know, it's a it's an inverse relationship. So buy gold. And, and I've written about ways that you can acquire gold and even store it outside the United States without having to leave home. Um, so that's that's an option. And but I wouldn't put everything in gold. Just to <laughs> jump in there, not to go into too much detail, but how would someone go about buying gold? Well, I mean, you can go down to, you, you know, there are gold dealers in, in every mm-hmm. major city and, you know, you can do it that way and keep it in a home safe or you can uh, go to an online broker, buy the gold and then have them store it for you. Uh, they have different storage uh, vault uh, arrangements within the United States. There are a lot of different companies that do that. And then there are companies that do it offshore. Um, I've mm-hmm. worked for a long time with New Zealand Bank, or sorry, New, Le- New Zealand Vault. Mm-hmm. Um, and the way they do it is you open up an account, you transfer money to them. Uh, so you have an account with them, you buy gold from them. They store it in a vault for you. Uh, and then whenever you want to transact, buy, sell gold, they do it for you. Uh, and basically you never have to even see the gold. It's there for you uh, all the time. Uh, and there are places like that. You see them in Singapore. Uh, there mm-hmm. are some in Europe. There's some in Canada. Uh, but, you know, basically it's a question of just, you know, looking for brokerages that also combine with storage. Right. Because you don't really want to keep like lots of kilogram bars in your home, right? I mean, no, no. Um, that's, <laughs> that's, not, that's, not, that's not something you want the neighborhood no. to know about. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think, you know, that's, and I've written a lot about that. Jeff Optic has also written about it. So there, there, there are plenty of options there. Yeah. And what can I just ask you, what, what is the benefits of storing gold offshore as opposed to in the U.S.? Well, you know, people talk again about things like, uh, you know, the potential for gold confiscation like happened in, in the, uh, uh, I think it was 1933, um, by federal executive order, uh, Franklin Roosevelt ordered that all gold be turned into the government because they needed it to stabilize the financial system during the, the banking crisis of, of the Great Depression. It's the only time it's ever happened, but memories are long when it comes to money. Mm-hmm. And so there's, there, you know, people trot that one out and say it could happen. Um, I don't think that's particularly likely, particularly now that we're no longer on the gold standard. But that's one. The other one, of course, is that gold uh, in its bullion form, in other words, not uh, collectible coins or jewelry or mm-hmm. anything like that. In its bullion form, gold is considered a commodity, not a financial asset. 
which means that it does not need to be reported to the IRS or to the Treasury Department as part of your global um, financial holdings. Um, every, we've talked about um, FATCA, the Foreign Account mm -hmm. Tax Compliance Act, or FBAR, the Report on uh, Offshore Financial Assets. Mm -hmm. And because gold is a commodity, it's like owning a home, right? Like I have a house here in Cape Town I'm sitting in right now. I don't have to report that as an asset to the, the U.S. government because it's not a financial asset. Gotcha. If I had enough money in my South African bank accounts to, to go over the threshold, then I would need to report it. But gold falls into the category like my house. And so a lot of, some people like that. They like the idea of knowing that they have a substantial portion of their wealth in a, a form that's easy to liquidate, to, you mm -hmm. know, to turn into cash if they want to, but without uh, Uncle Sam having to know. Right. No, that's good. That's interesting. Yeah. And so, right, we're all safe as banks. I know that Global Finance release a yearly list. And this mm -hmm. year was... Germany, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. But how useful is that to an American? Can they take advantage of that security? Well, here's a, a funny thing. I'm going to just say something that, that I think is, I, I've written about it, but it's kind of shocking to people. The US probably has one of the least safe banking systems in the world. If you look at the banking system right. in isolation from the regulatory system, mm -hmm. if you took away the Fed, the US would be, nobody would put money into US banks because they are run uh, at a much higher level of risk tolerance than and anywhere else in the world. In fact, I was reading an article this morning on The Economist talking about how European banks are intrinsically safer because they just don't do the things with right. depositors' money that American banks do. Now, that doesn't mean that U.S. banks are not safe, because as I said earlier, the Fed backstops them. Yeah. But the, the U.S. is the only country that can do that. Other countries can't. And so countries like Switzerland... In Germany, and Netherlands, Austria, South Korea, some of the other highly safe countries, um, they uh, intervene to, uh, to make sure that their banks don't take excessive risks mm -hmm. before they happen. So in other words, instead of coming in to solve the problem after it happens, most other countries uh, force the banks to operate more conservatively to avoid getting into trouble in the first place. Right. The caveat is that Switzerland recently got into trouble, Credit Suisse. Mm -hmm. And that was a kind of a one-off problem in the sense that Credit Suisse, going back for a long time, had engaged in a pattern of riskier behavior, um, but they had already been punished by shareholders. So they were already, it was already known that they were taking excessive risk relative to the European banking sector and to the Swiss sector. And the Swiss authorities intervened dramatically and decisively with no mercy. Right. They forced them to sell themselves to UBS. So even though that happened, I would say that Switzerland is still a very safe place. Now, how do you get your money over there? Well, the first thing to do is be rich <laughs> because right. most of these countries will only, take, <laughs> they'll only take your deposits if you have a lot of money. Okay. Um, basically, anything less than a million dollars, they won't even consider opening an account for you. If you have that kind of money and you're willing to open, you know, and you go to them and you say, I want to deposit money in your bank. Sure. And the reason for that is because they have to comply with the U.S. Uh, FATCA reporting requirements. And the that's, you know, that's a lot of work for them. And mm -hmm. it raises risk to have American clients. So Americans typically end up only banking with those kinds of institutions if they have a lot of money. Right. Now, there are some exceptions. I have a, uh, a contact in Switzerland that for years has been operating investment accounts on behalf of Americans for as little as $250,000 deposits. And they do those kinds of arrangements uh, because they are able to group money together. And they're not mixing their clients' money, but okay. the, the aggregate amount of money that, that these people invest with, with banks in Switzerland, private banks, in other words, not mm -hmm. you know, the big ones, but, but smaller family-run banks, the aggregate amount is big enough that they're willing to do American clients. So, mm -hmm. so that is a route. And uh, I plan to do an interview uh, at some point in April with, uh, uh, with somebody on that. Now, the other option that you have uh, is <clears throat> if you have a connection to a country, uh, whatever that connection may be, whether you have property there, maybe um, you have relatives there, maybe at some place you spend a lot of time in and you have, let's say, developed a relationship with a local um, uh, medical provider mm -hmm. or you've maybe got a local attorney who's helped you, you know, on something, any kind of connection that you can demonstrate to a local bank you know, in any country, look, you know, Mexico, just take as a as an right. example. 
that can help you to get an account. So a lot of our listeners have got properties overseas. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they may have either invested in them or they use them as holiday homes. That'll get you a bank account. Uh, that's not too much of a problem. Uh, and then, of course, there is the possibility that you can just show up at a foreign bank and say, well, I'd like to open an account. And then they're going to ask you all kinds of questions. Uh, and they might well open it for, uh, for you, but you're going to need to be there. Right. Uh, so one country that I know that will do that quite easily is Uruguay. Mm -hmm. uh, if you decide to take a week's vacation um, down there, you can go to a bank and then say, I'd like to deposit some money here. Uh, and as long as it's a reasonable amount of money, in other words, it's worth their the trouble of reporting uh, on FATCA, uh, that sort of stuff, they'll probably open an account for you. Um, but not every country is like that. Then there's a third option, which is HSBC, the big international mm -hmm. um, banking conglomerate. They will open accounts in up to 30 different countries for you remotely. You don't have to be there. But they will also ask you why. They want to know, why? well, why would you want to open an account in Ireland? Right? Mm -hmm. well, what's your business in Ireland? And you could say, well, maybe I am thinking about buying a home there. Or maybe um, I have relatives there that I'd like to be able to, you know, send gifts to, or, you know, as long as you've got some kind of a plausible connection, you can demonstrate it. You've got a clean financial record. HSBC will open an account for you. And once you've got an account with them, then that makes it easier to open another account because you've got a connection to the country. Right. So all is not lost. Uh, it just is not as easy as it used to be. It takes more time. It takes more convincing you have to meet sort of minimum financial thresholds. And mm -hmm. realistically speaking, that's, I think, good for everybody. Because if you're yeah. just going to put a couple of thousand dollars into a foreign bank account, it's not really going to help you a great deal. Yeah. So it really, you know, you're talking about reasonably significant amounts of money. Once you get to that level, everything is possible. So just to confirm, um, when you're dealing with, say, the if you're a high net worth individual, you don't have mm -hmm. to go there and you don't have to be connected to the country. If you have enough money, they will deal with you. If, yes. you, if yes. you're then, you know, someone like one of our listeners who has a property there or wants to maybe move there, they can open one if they have a connection to the country. And is that, a th is that the case with most of these um, world safest bank countries? Is there any, is there... Well, I mean, look, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, 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 the root of, of going to, like, if you're a high net worth individual going to, um, you know, one of the top tier countries, uh, really what matters there is, is money and assets. And, yeah. and whether you have assets in the country already or not, they'll, they'll take you. Um, for most other countries where people would likely have property, yes, absolutely, they'll take you. I mean, having property or business investments, or any kind of significant investment in a country, pretty much automatically qualifies mm -hmm. you for a bank account. Um, if you own a home, let's say, just pick a, out of the hat, Ecuador, for example. Right. Um, if you own property in Ecuador, um, most people will have an account with a, a rental management company that provides them with an escrow account. Well, having that means that you, know, you have a legitimate reason to go to another yeah. Ecuadorian bank and say, I'd like to open an account. Mm -hmm. uh, and they'll do that sort of thing for you. So so really, it's a question of just finding the wedge that opens the door and then right. pushing on it hard enough until it opens. Right, right. And I mean, I can obviously these are the world's safest banks. So there's a reason where people are putting their money there. But is it easy to kind of get your money in and out of these banks? Is it easy? Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, these days, everything is electronic, instantaneous. Um, you know, the it, conventional banks will charge you money to transfer uh, large amounts. Uh, but I, like, for example, I, I typically transfer money from my U.S. accounts to my South African accounts quite often, mm -hmm. or, you know, once a month, twice a month. Um, and I use services that will charge as little as $2 a transaction. Um, and for reasonably small amounts of money, uh, you know, it's kind of living expense type stuff. It's instant. You can have the money in your account within half an hour. Um, right. But generally speaking, the whole uh, system uh, is, is now uh, electronic and instant. Um, and there, there really are no obstacles. And, just and that's part of the problem. Yeah, that's part of the problem, true, actually. True. Because, if, you know, the, because you can take money out so quickly now, that's why, why banks uh, are subject to runs. That's right. one of the things that happen in the state. But for most people, uh, it's just a convenience, not a threat. Yeah. And I want to get your take on the likes of Revolut or the, on the online banking systems. What do you think of those? 
Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, kind of virtual banks, banks that don't have physical locations. Yeah. Uh, yeah why not? I mean, what's the point of a physical bank branch anymore, right? Yeah. Um, you, you know, I think for the most part, uh, as long as it's a solid financial institution, how you interact with it physically or not physically really doesn't matter. Um, now, you have to be careful because there have been a lot of innovations in this space and they haven't all worked out. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the German uh, fintech company. I can't remember their name right now, but, you know, they flamed out because they they were taking un, um, uh, undue risks. But, you know, as long as you've done your due diligence and uh, the, the, the institution is registered with the national regulators and is compliant and they can show that they're compliant with their national regulations, then, you know, you should be in, in a good place and there should not great. be any issues. Great, great. Well, Ted, again, thank you so much. This was really insightful. This is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to your knowledge on these on these kind of topics. Um, so if, pe if people are interested in leading a more, um, I guess, international life and diversifying themselves a little bit more, you can sign up to our postcards. Ted will be releasing a new service soon where he talks about all of these things and more. So do sign up. There's a link below. Um, and you can find Ted on the International Living website. There's a page dedicated to him where, where all of his articles are being pulled in. So go have an explore if you're interested in these topics. Um, but again, Ted, thank you so much. It was great. There's a doorbell. There's a doorbell. <laughs> somebody, somebody coming for me. You better get it. Right. Thanks so much all again. Right. Thanks, Lynn. I'll we'll, talk to you soon. We'll talk again soon. Bye. And there you have it, another episode of ILTV. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Be sure to hit the subscribe button below, turn on your notifications so you don't miss out on any future videos, and join me for next week's episode.